This following video is highlights of the rally on October the 20th, 1984, celebrating 20 years of the militants. Pleasure in introducing oh, our I'll, first I'll, speaker I'll, this morning, a comrade that needs no real introduction to any labor movement meeting, a comrade who has taken a principled stand against the witchin of militant in the party because of because it defends the real interests of the movement itself. Will the comrades give a warm well welcome to Tony Ben. Sisters and brothers, thank you very much for inviting me to come to speak at this rally today, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity of speaking on this platform, and I would like to express the thanks of the Chesterfield Labour Party for all the people here who came and helped in that campaign to which reference has just been made. We meet together in the middle of a titanic and momentous struggle to defend basic trade union and democratic rights and civil liberties. For that is what the miners' strike is all about. The true nature of this struggle is hidden from many people by a media determined to make scapegoats of individuals and of groups in order to conceal what is really happening. And even the bishops are discovering that, no doubt because they're members of the church militant. Now, the uh, Labour movement is not engaged, the Labour movement is not engaged in a personalised battle against individual cabinet ministers, nor do we seek to win public support by arguing that the crisis could be ended by the election of a new and more humane team of ministers who are better qualified to administer capitalism. We are working for a majority Labour government elected on a socialist program as decided by conference. South Africa has played a key role in the workers' movement there. That's Comrade Nimrod Sajaki, who is the leader of the Steel Workers Union in the Transvaal. I agree, comrade, to come and address this rally because I support the militants up to the hill. They have full confidence in the power of the working class. They must overthrow such leadership. They must fight for the freedom, not only of themselves, but for the freedom of their children and the future generations. Come on!
comrades, I'd like to thank Nimble for an excellent contribution. The next speaker we have, because he's dealing with the question of Liverpool, because Liverpool has been uh, beaten to the labour movement throughout the country in its battle against the Tories. And the militant supporters have played no small role in these successes, particularly in the local elections, the general election, and also the European election itself. And to disprove, therefore, that militant called the right wing is a liability for the movement. We did have to speak, Comrade Derek Hatton, but unfortunately, because of press with urgent business in relation to an important industrial dispute, is unable to attend, but gives his fraternal greetings to the rally. But we have a comrade equally well known in the labor movement, uh, comrade Tony Mulburn, who just arrived from the, who was a member of the National Aid, the NGA, and also president of the Liverpool District Labour Party. So without further ado, I'll call on Tony to introduce. Comrade Chairman and Comrades, at the 20th anniversary of the Millet newspaper, I think it's totally appropriate that a Liverpool representative should be on the platform, because the main thrust for the establishment of that paper, I think uh, quite correct and justified the same, came from the Liverpool area. The Comrades, you're in that campaign also. We had uh, many meetings with uh, Tory Minister Patrick Jenkin. And Jenkin argued, of course, that it was the ballot box that would decide, ultimately, what in fact the course of Liverpool would take. But Patrick Jenkin has changed his tune a little bit since then. Patrick Jenkin has been used by the results of ballot boxes now, with their preoccupation with the miners' ballot, and now rejection of NACOD's right to take, uh, to take strike action, even though they have had a ballot. What we now have is the thoughts of Patrick Jenkin in relation to democracy in action. He was questioned as to his attitude regarding the results in Liverpool. Mr Jenkin said it was because local election results are becoming increasingly unrepresentative of the majority wishes. <laughs> made, made worse, when council workers go out in force to vote Labour to preserve their own jobs. <laughs> he then goes on to say, he then goes on to say very profoundly from this Tory theoretician, he said, a survey of Liverpool of voting in the May elections showed the section of the population which contributed most to what was quite a high poll were council employees turning out in large numbers to vote for Labour candidates who were against job losses. He then goes on to say, that is, very profoundness, people voting with a strong measure of self-interest. <laughs> and this does give rise to some unease because it's the democratic system not actually working very well. <laughs> that is, we can have a certain amount of, that gives us a certain amount of light really in these trying times. But nevertheless, what it represents is a very sober warrant to the Labour movement that where democracy, the ballot box, doesn't produce a result satisfactory to the present Tory government, then they are trying with other means in order to, to circumvent the democratic process, which will take place increasingly in Britain as the ravages of this Tory government really percolate into the consciousness of the working class. Comrades, there's no question that the Liverpool victory represented an enormous step forward for the Labour movement on a national scale. There's no question that the advanced sections of the Labour movement have drawn lessons from that and have recognised the crucial and significant role that Labour, that uh, Millen supporters played in, in, in that victory. And that's why there's no question that the, there'll be overwhelming support for my appearance as a Labour city councillor, a Liverpool city councillor, on this platform today. Because, let us recall during the course of that campaign, every single journal in the Labour movement attacked, 
criticised, carpingly criticised, the position adopted by the comrades in the Liverpool City Council. Tribune, Labour Weekly, and I forget the name of the myriads of other papers who infest the outskirts of the Labour movement. The charges against uh, Labour in Liverpool was that they're on an ultra left binge, they're on an adventure, they're moving too far too fast, they're moving too far out in front, they're deliberately provoking confrontation. Comrades, I think it's, it's right that we should remind the movement at the 20th anniversary rally of the Millet newspaper. Out of all the newspapers in the Labour movement, there was one paper that stood absolutely firm under all kinds of pressure in its total and unequivocal support for the stand taken by the Liverpool City Council. My comrades, that paper was the Millet newspaper, the only paper in the whole of the British Labour movement. The magnificent campaign couldn't have taken place without Millet supporters. They have a magnificent support by the Millet newspaper. And a clear and graphic lesson to the Labour leadership. And if you want to get the results, if you want to win the allegiance and support of the working class in this country, then you have to stand on clear Marxist policies that workers can identify with. Then you have to be prepared, come what may, to make a courageous stand in defence of the programme on which you are elected. But workers understand one thing, workers understand results. And if you say to workers you are opposed to redundancies, you are going to create jobs, then you have to deliver the goods, or the workers, quite rightly, will reject you. The stand taken by Millet in that campaign is a total vindication of the ideas enunciated by the paper in the last 20 years. I believe the next 20 years we'll see a magnificent growth in the ideas in the, in the paper itself, and some others growth in the support of the papers. Because we've said, and Sotsky indicated many, many times, that once the ideas of Marxism are accepted by the majority of the working class, they then become a mass force within society itself. And once the working class are mobilised, armed with the ideas of Marxism, they would become an irresistible force. That what took place in Liverpool will be emulated on a national scale and we will be well on our way to transform society in a socialist manner, in a manner which has long been advocated by the military itself. The 20th anniversary of the military newspaper it's also the first anniversary of the expulsions of five of our editorial board members. The shameful expulsions. But as Pat Wall explained last year at Labour Party conference, you can, expel, you can expel individuals, but you can never expel ideas from this movement. <laughs> and therefore, I'd like to introduce a comrade who needs again no introduction to a militant rally that is the editor of the militant Comrade Peter Tapp. Comrade Chairman and comrades, this is not just another meeting of militant supporters from all over the country. For myself, for Comrade Ted Grant, for our editorial board, for that handful of comrades who began the militant newspaper something like two decades ago, this is a special occasion. This is almost like a holiday, if you like, for those comrades who've been battling for the ideas of socialism and Marxism within the labour movement over this period. And if you examine the press, even in the course of the last week alone, it's virtually impossible now to either turn on the TV, to open a newspaper, to listen to the radio without some mention or other 
of the militant, of the militant tendency, or of the alleged ideas of the militant itself. In fact, you could say that there's almost a cottage industry has sprung up which deals in the alleged ideas of militant. This week alone, we've had two references in the diary of the Times, one reference in the Guardian diary, and no doubt even from this valley, perhaps we'll supply them with a few more items on Monday or next week. If you take the last year alone, we have on that very good program, I believe, I never watched it myself, Coronation Street, <laughs> an alleged militant supporter selling the copy of Militant to Hilda Hopton, I think it was. <laughs> We have a vile distortion of the ideas of militant on it will be all right on the night when the commentator said if things or objects behave strangely it's not necessarily a member of the militant tendency. <laughs> we have a, a documentary on India in which it was automatically referred to as a particular section of the movement there as having the same ideas as the militant tendency. Not entirely accurate. And unbelievably, we even had a question in the Daily Telegraph which was about the militant. I think the question was something, it's militant, and the answer was tendency. Not very difficult to work out for our comrades. There was even, unbelievably again, a question in the GCE A-level course recently discussed the ideas of the militant tendency. We hope there will be many people who took that paper who are sitting in this meeting here today. The comrade that I consider takes the biscuits, at least in the past period, has been the marvellous article that recently appeared in the newly acquired Daily Mirror by Bob Maxwell battling Bob, I think he likes to be called now, usually standing on his table while his journalists are on, it, on their knees at editorial board meetings. And I was highly amused at an article allegedly describing the ideas of the militant tendency. And in the course of this article, I had to scratch my head, rub my eyes a couple of times, because he quotes me as saying, this is what I actually, literally, I'm supposed to have said, in relation to potential middle-class recruits to militants, that I advocated that they be dried in the wind, buried in the snow, dried on the grill, then dried in the wind, and buried in the snow again. I don't know what Bob Maxwell thinks we are, but we want some kind of middle-class shish kebab.
when the right wing in the Labour Party had condemned almost to an historical curiosity shock the ideas of socialism, the ideas of Marxism. We can stand at this conference today and we can survey the battered working class communities of Britain. The fact that in my own hometown at the present time that are working men and women who are compelled to eke out an existence on the rubbish heaps, almost the favelas, the shanty towns have begun to reappear on the outskirts of the major cities of Britain at the present time. But 20 years ago, the right wing in the Labour Party said the situation of the 30s, of mass unemployment, of overproduction and slump, have been banished by Labour governments, have been banished by the ideas of right-wing reformism. We argued with our tiny voice of Marxism at that stage that as sure as night follows day, all the horrors of the past would come back to haunt future generations of working people. We didn't say that because we possess some kind of messianic blind faith in the working class, or we had some kind of emotional objection to capitalism. Only the Marxists, not even the left leaders in the Labour Party, understood at that stage, or even at this, this stage, the terrible long-term crisis of British capitalism, understood the laws of the development of capitalist society, the inevitability of a clash between the classes, the likes of which we see unfolding in Britain at the present time. And comrades, the advantage of the compass of Marxism has been demonstrated above all, I believe, by the experiences of the working class and the labour movement in the course of the last two or three years. Doesn't it seem incredible? Doesn't it take a leap of the imagination today to think back to the period immediately after the general election of 1983, when every single trend within the Labour movement was predicting gloom, was saying that the Labour movement was defeated, with the exception of the militant tendency, that the working class have been bought off by capitalism, that the young miners, horror upon horror, had actually bought their own houses. Some of them had even put press door knockers on those houses and seduced away from the ideas of socialism and of Marxism. But comrades, the minor strike could have been predicted and indeed was predicted by the supporters of the militant tendency. The clash that is taking place today has nothing to do with any personal whim of Mrs. Thatcher. It's not because Thatcher is cruel and wicked, although we wouldn't disagree with that particular description. It's not because Sir G. Keith Joseph may be a little bit insane, although anybody who sleeps through the Brighton bombing... <laughs> ...while some of his compatriots are falling three or four floors, there must be something a little bit strange about that individual. the attacks on the miners 
the attacks on the steel workers, the attacks on other working people in Britain is not some kind of epilepsy of this government, but arises from the long-term crisis of British capitalism. In this strike, what a marvel it is to behold the enormous resilience, the willpower, the talent, the reservoir of struggle that exists within the miners and within the working class. What an answer to all those faint hearts who were crying in their beer 12 or 18 months ago that the working people would never move. What lions are the young miners out on the picket lines at the present time? And what a marvel to behold the working class women in the mining villages, the wives and the girlfriends of the miners. The Tory government, with all the weapons at their disposal, but also, let's be clear about this, they've answered and had to combat the ideas of Professor Hobsbawm, of some inside the movement who said, never who said, that they would never move into action 12 or 18 months ago. The miners' strike has shown all that's best within the ranks of the British working class. For comrades, the Marxists, are not only the most enthusiastic section of the labour movement, are not only the most intrepid fighters alongside the miners and other workers, we are also, we believe, the most realist exception of the British working class. The fighters have shown in the course of this, this battle great tremendous willpower. But let's be absolutely clear about this. Thatcher might be evil. Their system might be insane, but the ruling class at least prepared for this battle. They were like generals who surveyed the scene very, very carefully. She got a bloody nose in 1981. Even going back to 1972 and 1974, the ruling class in Britain don't believe the fairy tales of the right wing of the Labour movement that we don't have a class struggle. Of course, she said at the Tory Party Conference, this strike was not of the government's making. What a load of hurry. That government prepared consciously. Thatcher is a consummate representative of her class. Let us give credit to the devil in this case, the she-devil representing her class. Unfortunately, with the exception of the Marxists, no other section of the Labour movement prepared for the struggle that is taking place at the present time. The campus built up coal stocks. They beefed up the police. It's a scandal that any leader of the Labour movement can talk about violence on the picket line. We've had violence, but we've had police riots in Fitzwilliam, in Armflow, in Grindflow, and other areas of the country. The apology of that police chief on the TV the other day spoke volumes about what is happening in the mining areas of Britain at the present time. This government has built up a police force. They consciously show Jones Corton Wood because Corton Wood had voted 60-40 against strike action in 1981. They thought they had the miners by the short and curly, but they reckoned without the enormous willpower that ability of the miners that has been shown in the course of this struggle. And not only the miners, but the enormous solidarity, at least at the bottom, of ordinary working people. The marvellous international support that has been given by co thinkers and the militants in Denmark, in Sweden, in France, in Belgium, in America, indeed throughout the world. Workers in France who face deceit in defeat enormously encouraged by the struggle of the British mine workers itself. And yet, Comrade Peter said, we've arrived at the stage now, after eight months of struggle, when it will take all the will and all the resolve of the organised labour movement to ensure victory for the miners. The miners are winning. Take no notice of what Thatcher said and Walker said on the 
TV about 12 months of stockpiles of coal. It's a little lighter in the Times Diary, which gives more of a realistic picture than all the speeches of the Tories or the Catholic press. When it was pointed out that the government has stockpiled 14 million candles way back in July for the coming winter, what an encouraging vision we have. Of the mandarins of the treasury, dressed like Wee Willy Winky, falling <laughs> over their plans to defeat the miners in the course of the winter itself. Of candle factories that are working overtime. Of the colossal support now which is coming to the miners. What a marvelous decision it was of Nathods to come out and propose strike action. that the miners have now got the NCB and this government by the Nakods. <laughs> Which of course is only another way of saying by the scrub of the net. <laughs> it's incredible that a union that's never been on strike in its history. Have you seen Ken Sampy? <laughs> Not Matt Nesby, but the other fella, Ken Sampy. I saw him on the TV, I couldn't believe it. He had a deer stalker. And he had a pipe, he almost was a modern reincarnation of Sherlock Holmes. And yet this very moderate mind, but the very moderate, mild individual, never had a strike in their history, has been forced to come out on strike by. Because in the negotiations last week, because he got his orders from Thatcher, he went into those negotiations, he went into those discussions, and the first thing that this creature McGregor said when he marched into the room was, this room stinks, and everything in it stinks. There is the real voice of the ruling class in Britain. Behind the scenes, this government and the ruling class last week were talking in the language of the strategists of capital in 1926. When Lord Londonderry said, we'll take on the trade unions, and it doesn't matter how much blood and treasure it takes, we'll smash them from top to bottom. That's what they were discussing. That's the meaning of McGregor's speech last week. Of course, he apologised when Nathan came out on strike and said he was deferring to the paint in the building. He was allergic to paint. There was nothing of the kind. The ruling class behind the scenes are flirting with the idea of even using the troops against the miners and using the call of the pit at the present time. Say what you like about these people. They are acting according to their lights. What a scandal it is that within our ranks, within the labor movement, the ruling class have divisions. They're very careful to conceal out behind the scenes. What a scandal it is and I make no apologies in making that point at this platform here today. That we have, as a trade union leader, as a member of the Labour Party, when I'm expelled, we're welcome in the mining villages of Kent and Scotland, of North East of Wales and of Yorkshire. But I'll tell you what, that out and out traitor Hammond wouldn't be welcome amongst the rest of Despite the vote that he had in the power stations, and in effect it was a recommendation by the EEP2 leadership to come out against solidarity action. The miners are winning, but victory can be guaranteed only if the leadership comes from the Labour movement itself. Because if you look at the TUC and Labour Party conference, wasn't it a scandal that when the president of the NUM was facing a fine that the union was being sequestrated, because that's what the £200,000 fine means, that you had the position where the government was trying to cross the NUM, that the Labour Party conference, when Tony Mulher moved the resolution, 
demanding a 24 hour general strike. That was opposed by the platform. The prevarication, the hesitation of the leaders of the Labour movement, we say this unequivocally, has been a direct encouragement to the ruling class and this government to take even further and stronger action. The very minimum that should be done is a 24-hour general strike. If they move in to sequestrate the funds of the miners, we're not going to allow the National Union of Mine Workers and their families to be starved back to work. If they then move the troops in, by the end of this week, no equivocation, it shall be all out action by the Labour. What the miners have raised in the course of this 
struggle, fast strobingly and hesitatingly, is the idea of a planned economy. The difference between the militants and all of the trends within the labour movement is we'll fight shoulder to shoulder. We'll give the lead as we have done in some of the minefields of Britain, particularly in solidarity work with working people. But we say to all workers now, such is the crisis of British capitalism, that what you gain with the left hand, the ruling class will attempt to take back with the right hand. We're not in the 60s when militants began. We're not even in the 70s. We're in the 80s and the 90s, when the capitalism is incapable of delivering the jobs to ordinary working people, of giving a decent house, of giving an education to the population of Britain and indeed the whole of the advanced capitalist world. Therefore, Poe's point blank is this movement on with the general program of socialism that the militants has outlined. A 35 hour week, yes, a hundred pound minimum wage, a massive program to boost public spending, but above all that can only be carried through by a future socialist Labour government nationalising not every fish and chip shop, but the 200 monopolies that control 80 to 85 percent of the economy. Compensation that is crippling the mine industry at the present time to the ex owners of that industry. But we believe in compensation on the basis of proven need, perhaps with £15 deducted from the ex owners of industry, like they deducted from the mine industry. Comrade okay, Chairman and comrades, I believe that programme is finding increased support amongst working people in Britain today. It is reflected in this valley here, which is only one of many of the activities that the militant newspaper has organised in the course of the last two or three months in particular. A period of intense activity, but very rewarding for socialism and Marxism, fighting shoulder to shoulder with our class at the present time. The miners' strike has given us a glimpse of what we said 20 years ago that the mighty labour and trade union movement in Britain, that the working class in Britain is an invincible force. The tragedy is, it's not conscious of its power. It has reformist cataracts on its eyes. It cannot see the way forward. But once those reformist cataracts are torn from its eyes, it will become a power, the likes of which this or any society has never seen. Marxism is now a powerful force amongst the youth, amongst the trade unions, has grown immeasurably within the Labour Party despite the attempts to drive us out. We are not a majority, we say that, but on the basis of the march of events and the arguments of our comrades, Marxism and socialism, from becoming the weapons of perhaps a minority of the most conscious advanced workers today, will become a powerful lever for this mighty labour and trade union movement to conquer power and to establish a social society. We intend in the course of the next period to go from a weekly, by perhaps the spring of next year, to a twice weekly. We give a pledge to the working people of Britain. We give a pledge to the miners in particular. We were hamstrung in the course of this strike. How wonderful it would have been to have had a daily newspaper countering the lies, the misinformation of the capitalist press and the media. <laughs> and therefore we pledge that by the end of 85 or 86, not just this on this platform, but you comrades, to those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers out there who are looking for a way forward. A daily militant will become an indispensable weapon 
for transforming the labor movement, for making it conscious of its power, for making Marxism the weapons of millions of working people, to put into the rubbish heap of history, capitalist society and all its attendant misery, all its attendant miseries of poverty, of unemployment and so on, and establishing here in Britain, which will be like a beacon to the workers throughout the world, a socialist and a democratic Britain that generations of workers are striven for. That's our goal. The task begins now. Build a powerful organ of socialism and Marxism and go forward to the victory of the working class in the period that is now opening up.